Welcome to your week in review here on the WWE Podcast. And tonight, we've got a lot to discuss with The Fiend attacking Randy Orton on Monday Night Raw, if Sheamus will actually turn on Drew, Sasha Banks and Carmella giving away their women's championship match on SmackDown, the Street Profits continuing their nonsense, and will Big E ever get serious? All that and a ton more right after this. Introducing Elevated Recovery at ElevatedRecovery.org. Would you like to regain control of your life from compulsive sexual behaviors such as sex and porn addiction, which is disrupting your happiness, career, and other relationships? Does your professional position or prominence in your community make traditional recovery impossible for you? Elevated Recovery is an online addiction recovery service for busy professionals. They have successfully guided hundreds of high-achieving men and their partners through uncontrollable sexual behaviors. Behaviors such as serial affairs, porn addiction, habits of patronizing prostitutes, and other situations that have left well-meaning, good men open to the risks of divorce, job loss, sexual harassment litigation, and severe underachievement in their own lives. At Elevated Recovery, their clients include top-performing sales professionals, business owners, physicians, celebrity broadcast personalities, professional athletes, lawyers, engineers, and politicians from over 20 countries. Elevated Recovery is endorsed by therapists, mental health professionals, marriage counselors, and relationship experts from around the globe. Learn more by visiting the website elevatedrecovery.org. That's elevatedrecovery.org. Go check it out now. You can also connect on Instagram, Elevated Recovery, and connect on Facebook, Porn Reboot, and follow on Twitter at Reboot Porn. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, the most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show, giving you a no-bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do, too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold said so. Okay, everybody, welcome to the WWE Podcast for this Week in Review episode. And a big week right now in WWE. Tons of stuff to come this week. Content-wise, pay-per-view-wise, it's a big week. Welcome to the final pay-per-view before Royal Rumble. How about that for perspective? We are one pay-per-view away from the Royal Rumble. So, WWE now is in their new home of the Tropicana, Tropicana Field in Tampa, Florida where the uh, Rays play, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't feel any different on SmackDown. It felt relatively the same. I think that's the general consensus from most people that I've heard and listened to other podcasts and things, that it just plain plain out didn't feel different. But maybe that'll change when a pay-per-view happens and they change sets, and maybe they, hey, maybe they let in a small number of people. Now, that's possible. Uh, I think that with the vaccine coming out, it'll obviously be distributed to those who need it most first, meaning the elderly, uh, those in hospitals, frontline workers. Those, you know, that'll all happen first. But I think it looks like we should all have it widely available in February, March time frame. Now, whether or not you're concerned about getting it or you're skeptical, whatever, that's a different story, but the availability should be there in a few months for everyone to get one if they want to go get one, which I guess is a two, two shot thing. Uh, so that means what that all means is I'm not trying to talk about coronavirus too much on the show because you hear it everywhere you go, but it affects uh, the WWE and here what we talk about, because I think WWE could have fans back in three to five months. I mean, legitimate fans back. And that means if you do the math in time for WrestleMania, Yes, it, it looks like it's plausible that we have a at least a semi-filled building for WrestleMania. Now, where that takes place, of course, we don't know. Uh, it may not take place where it's supposed to in L.A. and all that kind of thing. So, that all being said, I am encouraged by the news of the vaccine and the numbers and the projections of when it will be widely available. So, there's something to look forward to, right? I mean, hey, sports suck without fans there. Let's be honest. And we're going to look back at this time and be like, oh my God, how did we deal with no fans? You know, um, and especially, especially in wrestling, you need it more in wrestling, I think, than any other sport ever. 
And I think we could get there in 2021. I think it's very possible in the spring and summer that we could see capacity buildings if if uh, if things go according to plan. I mean, maybe by Memorial Day, if things go according to plan, maybe you could have packed places again. No masks. Imagine that. No social distancing. They can take all those damn signs down in your grocery store and they can get rid of all that crap that we're all just waiting to just get back to normal. And it looks like... There is a possible end in sight, and things could get back to a semi-normal capacity in the springtime. So, hey, light at the end of the tunnel uh, in a personal, professional uh, format for all of us. So that's something to just want to just wanted to bring up, right? So in case you didn't know about it already, and many many of you probably do, but it's hope, right? So, all right, well, guys, TLC's this week. This week, a week from tonight, is TLC. So we've got a lot of coverage here for you on the WWE podcast, and that means Saturday night will be our prediction show, and then Sunday, uh, late, late Sunday night, I will continue my format with The Botch Guy on YouTube, which, by the way, go check out his channel, for God's sakes. The YouTube, uh, the YouTube, God almighty, I sound like I'm 80 years old. Go to YouTube and follow The Botch Guy. Really great content, quick videos, passionate, smart uh, all of the above. If you're a wrestling fan, this is an absolute must. Go subscribe because we will be doing a joint show here on the WWE podcast for a post pay per view TLC show review show immediately following the pay per view. So again, late late night for me, but y'all don't care. But it'll be good because for you guys, you get the instant reaction when you wake up, or if you're up really late on Sunday night into early Monday morning, you could get it into your feed and get that quick reaction back to your uh, your device. So that's the that's the plan. I normally, again, don't do show Saturday, but that's what we're doing this week, and uh, it's a pay-per-view week, and then is the big one. The next one's the big one. I'm really looking forward to the Royal Rumble, but uh, we'll get there uh, in the coming weeks. So, boy... Um, you know, I've listened to a lot of different podcasts uh, this week, and we all know the big ones. I'm not going to give them the, the the free advertising, and they're great podcasts. It just doesn't make sense for me to do so. We all know who they are and what they are, uh, and they're big and good, great for a reason. And I heard a lot of negative feedback on SmackDown. I heard a lot of negative feedback on uh, the show itself, that it was brutal, it was awful, uh, and that really without Roman Reigns, SmackDown just flat out sucked this week. And... I will say, I didn't think it was the greatest SmackDown in the world, but I didn't think it was a complete bomb either. I mean, I've certainly seen more shows and, you know, had I not heard that feedback from the the big voices in wrestling podcasting world, I probably wouldn't have come on here and even addressed something like that. It it wasn't the greatest SmackDown in the world, but again, I I didn't think it was God awful. Uh, There were certainly segments that were eye rolling, even including Kevin Owens, who was scripted to talk about uh, his friends, and we'll get to that. But yes, Roman Reigns is an absolute shining light, and he is carrying SmackDown on his back. There's no doubt about it that Kevin o- or Ke- uh, Roman Reigns rather is absolutely killing it. I've been saying this really since he turned heel in late August, and it has been an absolute joy to watch. I've gotten no complaints, uh, none. I have zero bad to say about Roman Reigns, nothing, which comes off of six years of complaining about him being a babyface and tearing him apart every week for the scripted corporate nature of his character. But now he comes in and he feels like he's just walking into work being this miserable, entitled SOB, and it's damn brilliant. And Paul Heyman at his side this week, who had a bit more of an expanded role, uh, really talking off mic, but with the camera mic there, it feels a little bit more authentic. When he challenged, or Kevin Owens challenged him to come out after Jey Uso attacked Kevin Owens, and uh, then Roman comes out and Paul Heyman pulls him back and says that no, this is you make you make the rules, you call the shots. We don't do this on his time. You would do this on yours. And it seems as if maybe they're utilizing Paul Heyman in a bit more expanded uh, in, in an expanded role. And I, I'm for that. I'm totally for that. What I wouldn't, didn't want and don't want, and I can't believe I'm saying this, and had you told me this four months ago that I'd be saying this, I wouldn't believe you, is that I do not want Paul Heyman being a mouthpiece for Roman Reigns. You know who I want being a mouthpiece for Roman Reigns? 
you guessed it, Roman Reigns, because he has been utterly brilliant. And it's not that he's cutting five-star promos, right? It's not that he's completely killing it on the mic. He's he's just authentic. So he's not cutting cutting wrestling promos. He's just being him. That's what makes it so great. And I know we look at the the evaluation of a wrestling promo on certain criteria and that it needs to make you feel something and that it you know, tells the story, takes you on a ride, even with just verbiage. But with Roman Reigns, he has his kind of own way of being brilliant. You know how, you, how he does it? By being himself. And do I think he's an actual D-bag? No, I met the guy in real life. You know, again, very, very brief, only a few minutes. And he was very endearing, you know, very nice guy. I'm sure he's a, truly a family man, all that kind of thing. But inside somewhere lives this man you're seeing on TV, or he wouldn't be so damn good at it on TV. Uh, so, you know, hey, the whatever whatever the case may be, I'm loving what this is. I'm loving what I'm seeing. Uh, Paul Heyman, I do not want speaking for Roman Reigns. Um, if it is, it's in a limited capacity. But maybe this is more of what Paul Heyman is there to be other than just giving, you know, kind of hilarious facials to Roman Reigns and and the the side eyeing and not giving him eye contact, all that kind of thing. It seems as if they're kind of moving on to what Paul Heyman's role will be, utilizing a, a great personality like Paul Heyman on TV makes total sense. And for a long time, he's just kind of been that silent guy, which is bizarre that you're, Paul Heyman's being the silent guy, but he hasn't needed to speak. He hasn't needed to, and I'm sure that the higher-ups felt, and I would have agreed at the time, that, hey, pair him with Roman Reigns, right? If you're going to turn him heel, put Paul Heyman with him, he can speak for Roman because Roman's not great at promos. Well, it turns out, when you turn him heel, he can just be himself and doesn't need a script, and he feels a million times more comfortable. Imagine that, something that... 95% of fans saw coming, 95% of fans, uh, again, that's not a scientific number, it's just kind of a very exaggerated uh, point I'm making, is that we all saw this possibility, we all saw how great he could be, and now it's here, and it's even better in some cases than we all would have imagined. It's just a damn shame there's no fans, but maybe soon, maybe soon. And I don't want Roman to turn back babyface for a year to two years. That's a long-ass time in wrestling. And I understand that. It's an eternity in wrestling. But I am willing to squeeze every last drop of this Roman heel turn out before he gets to the babyface. Which, when I think he turns back babyface, will be the babyface success that Vince had always envisioned his first run being. He just Vince decided to skip this part, which is a critical, crucial, fatal error in the Roman Reigns story was to just jump from the shield to bam, in your face, main event. This is the guy we're going forward. Screw the fans. Uh, we're you know, we're going to just press forward. I'm not listening to any heel turn stuff. And all the fans are like, no, no, we're not accepting this, right? And we didn't accept it. We didn't accept it. We didn't accept it. They'd boo him out of buildings. Yes, there were some mixed reactions, but ultimately at the end of the day, it wasn't the reaction that Vince wanted. And now look at what we're getting. And I believe, I truly believe that when he comes out of this on the back end as a baby face, which will happen, he will be a massive success. He will be so far ahead of where he was in version one of the Roman Reigns baby face character. And uh, I, I, I think it's going to be really, really good. Uh, now, does some of the old Roman Reigns hang on? Pop, maybe, right? I don't need him smiling and... Uh, you know, going back to corporate Roman, but I think he'll learn a lot from this heel run, and I hope it's many, 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 many months longer. So, okay, well, uh, that's just what I wanted to start off with was Roman Reigns because it's a such a highlight. It, it's great. Uh, the Kevin Owens part of it, it, Kevin Owens is doing you know ad- admirably just as well. And if it wasn't Roman Reigns holding that belt, I would say, hey, let's see what KO's got right now. You know, let's see, let's see what happens. Uh, don't forget, though, we're rolling into WrestleMania season, and nine times out of ten, the better story is for the babyface to chase the heel for the championship. And now we're we're kind of scratching on WrestleMania season, like we can sniff it, we can see it in the distance. And you want a heel champion, maybe even a long-standing heel champion, 
going into that pay-per-view. So the babyface chasing has a great story to tell. And that's what I think is going to happen. You'll see a lot more heel champions take shape. We already have that in uh, the Universal Championship. We have that with the Intercontinental Championship. We have that with the United States Championship. The only ones that aren't uh, heel are the... Well, actually, a good deal that I'm thinking about it. The Raw Women's Championship, the two SmackDown champ- team, Tag Team Championships, uh, Raw and SmackDown, and then uh, the WWE Championship as well. And so even the, well, the Women's Tag Team Championships are held by heels, but those are about as relevant as uh, as my water bottle sitting in front of me. So, hey, um, that that's really how, what I would look to is a lot of heel championships starting to take place or baby faces dropping them the next month. Uh, and, and that's just kind of the way it goes. But at, at the same time, don't forget too, this is the time of year where creative tends to take a slumber. So those that are, uh, you know, kind of complaining about SmackDown last night or two nights ago, rather, it could be just the creative slumber that happens every cycle. It's just the way it goes in December. And I've said this many times on this show, the creative slumber happens in November, December, right after Survivor Series. Boom! They kind of just take a nap and put themselves on autopilot and go. We'll see you in in, uh, in in January, right? And let's build to the Rumble. That's what they do. December is historically a very low intelligence, uh, low IQ, low creative direction month. It's a very just uh, just kind of lackluster. And it's been expected. The bar has been set very low for December in terms of creative direction and uh, awe-inspiring returns, everything like that. And it's, it's just it's not kind of, it doesn't happen almost ever. All right, so uh, just touching on Kevin Owens a little bit more, and then we'll move on to a different story here. The Kevin Owens part of this, again, I said he's doing very good. I think he is doing very good. And had Roman not being the one holding the belt, I would say give him a shot. But Roman's so damn good, I'm actually willing to sacrifice the Kevin Owens title run right now that's how good roman is and what he did last two, i keep saying last night two nights ago on smackdown took it to another level with himself because his character because what well first of all what roman did to ko backstage yelling into the camera that i put food on your tables talking to kevin owens family directly and i can be the one to take it off of him if you don't straighten your husband out i mean you talk about getting personal, talking to people's families and kids. This is downright just sadistic stuff. Uh, I love it. I'm a, I, I'm a, that was just great. It was probably the best part of SmackDown. Uh, Kevin Owens in the ring talking about, I'm going to introduce you to my three friends, table, ladder, and chair. Uh, yeah, that wasn't the greatest. Kevin, Kevin Owens did what he could with that. It, it, you know, he, he didn't make it god awful, but you can only do so much with just garbage writing. I mean, you, you, you can only do so much with Vince trying to make humor out of a, out of a program that doesn't need humor at all. Uh, I, I don't think Kevin Owens had anything to do with this particular uh, script that he was reading from his mind. This seems directly from the mind of Vince McMahon or Kevin Sullivan. Um, there's just no, nobody else that would have that, that type of humor that thinks it's funny or, or ironic or cute or clever. It's not. It's not, and Kevin Owens' character doesn't fit, especially with what's going on right now, um, being in the Universal Championship picture. I, it didn't work for me. I'll just say that. It wasn't the worst thing of the night, but it was just kind of like, uh, I mean, you just know who's writing it, who thinks it's funny, and you're just groaning going, do you, do you have any concept of comedy? Right? Um, all right. Well, moving on to another story here, another program. I know it took a quite, quite a bit of time talking about Roman and Kevin Owens, but I think it's important too because it's it's a really good thing happening right now. I, I'd like to spend some time on the positive. Another kind of positive thing going on, and particularly on SmackDown, Sasha Banks and Carmella. Now, I've heard people destroy this. I've heard people go, Carmella, really? I've heard talk, people just running down Sasha Banks, uh, that what is Carmella doing right now? I, I've heard it all. And, and well, here's my take. I think that Carmella, and this is the good part of this, has been reinvented. I think Carmella has done a very good job in the three, four weeks since she's been back. She feels different, looks different, sounds different. That's good. She's taking off that old clothing of her being a comedy side act 
kind of, uh, you know, sidekick to whoever she's managing or working with in a comedy role, which is what she's done. I mean, for the last, oh my gosh, I don't know, year more with our truth prior, maybe more than that a year, two years, it feels like. And the whole James Ellsworth thing didn't really do her any favors either prior to our truth. And now we're seeing a much more confident, uh, just, just aggressive version of Carmela, and I'm digging it. I really am digging it. And yes, she's wearing all red, which you know Eva Marie did, but Eva Marie is all but forgotten uh, at this point. Where and what was it? What was her gimmick? Everything red or something like that. And she would always find an excuse not to compete that week, which I actually started to enjoy. Um, and then she kind of just went away. But Carmela, right now, I'm digging it. It's something new. Yeah, other than Bailey and Sasha, which again, y'all know, I really thought they dropped the ball hard on that one. They drop her, they drop Carmella instantly into this championship picture. And again, I'm really liking the character. There's, It's very unlikable. It's obnoxious. And actually, I think she's outperformed Sasha Banks on the mic big time. And that's where I'll turn to Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks is a she she's in trouble right now and i mean that as a character from a character perspective not in real life but as a character she is so flawed from the logic that how she turned babyface still doesn't make sense if you may be saying what are you talking about if you never listen to me here's what i'm talking about here's how it doesn't make sense that she turned to a babyface because she never did she never did this is essentially heel versus heel you may be saying, what are you talking about? Sasha Banks is a baby. When did she turn babyface? Give me the moment. Give me the moment in which Sasha Banks actually turned babyface to me. Tell me. I, you know, I have a feeling. People are out there going, what are you, oh, what are you talking about? It's when Bailey attacked her. Well, what, what exactly about that makes Sasha Banks a babyface? Ex- explain that. What? Because she didn't see it coming and she's too stupid to see it coming and she was supposed to be the smart one babyface in the whole thing? So she's not smart enough to see that Bailey was going to turn on her. So that's what sympathetic pity. What is it? I mean, that is not a baby face turn. That's just, you got outsmarted by your opponent, right? That, that, that's not a baby face turn. And then her programs and her uh, promos after that, and that programs promos after that were not great with Bailey. They just weren't. She was very obnoxious. She was coming through very unlikable on the screen, uh, overconfident, cocky. And I was not a fan. She never really changed. She never explained why, uh, you know, why, what this means to her. It was all just, I'm the boss shaking her head with attitude. And it was not endearing at all, at all. And now she's in Carmela's face and, uh, well, Carmela, yes, Carmela picked the fight. I understand that, but it's the same Sasha Banks. It's the same attitude. Um, There's just nothing about her that's appealing. She's not good on the mic either right now. She's never was blow away. Like Sasha Banks was never blow away on the mic. She'd have some funny lines here or not funny, but she'd have some good lines here and there, but she never really to me was one of those people you could count on to have an a plus promo to bring you home. She just never was. And I'm not saying promos are easy. <laughs> they're, they're hard as hell. I could not cut one. Uh, so I see why a lot of stars opt to just not rock the boat and just take the script and memorize it and then say your lines and you know recite them in a way that doesn't make it sound like you're reading. I get all that. It's easier to do. But uh, Sasha Banks is really in a rut of character. She is just spinning her wheels as this arrogant, uh, I'm the boss. Well, what the, what the F does that mean? Right? Like what? What is it supposed to mean? You you call yourself the boss. Like, I know it's a nickname. I get it. But like, what exactly are you the boss of? Who do you control? I don't I don't understand this. I mean, you add on top of the fact that Michael Cole saying it's boss time every single time. Like he is like Vince McMahon just has a button that he pushes that's connected to Michael Cole's brain. And every time Sasha Banks music hits, he 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 just forces him to say it's boss time. I think he had the same button when Roman Reigns came out and it was the big dog, right? It, 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 Michael Cole saying boss time reminds me of big dog. It's it, Why do we have to say this? Can, can we just let the, uh, let, the, let the graphics speak for themselves or let the characters speak for themselves? I, I just disp- 
despise when Michael Cole says boss time. It, it immediately takes away the realism of what's happening because he just says it every time. Like WWE saying every single time, welcome to the award-winning, criti- critically acclaimed, uh, specifically developed for the uh, WWE Universe Thunderdome, right? Like, And both announcers on both shows say the same thing. Tom Phillips and Michael Cole say the same thing exactly the way it's written every single time. Like, these little things in production can be easily fixed and no one bothers, no one cares. Just like every every time you go to Monday Night Raw, why do we have to have someone welcome us to Monday Night Raw every single time we get on the show? It could be Drew McIntyre coming out. It could just be, oh, hey, Randy Orton coming out. Every single person has to welcome us to Monday Night Raw. Why? You don't welcome someone to the show. You know what show you're watching. I, I mean, does anyone that watching a show not know what show you're watching? Furthermore, when you say welcome to Monday Night Raw, like, it's kind of like, hey, welcome to the show. We're we'll all bow at the end and, you know, curtsy. It, it's just, I don't know. Uh, I'm going on a total tangent. But some of these little things are just so corporate. It's it's so minute. And you guys may be saying, my God, he's just talking. About-. No, it's so minute. But it, it's such a, it represents a much, much bigger problem. It's such a, it's a microcosm of a much larger issue. And it's been going on forever. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to speak my uh, way into just a, a, a tunnel here, a rabbit hole. So Sasha Banks, though, getting back to it, is, man, I like I said, she's not an easy character to like. In fact, I actually find myself siding a little bit more with Carmella or, or kind of in a way that's just like I, I don't really care who wins because I dislike both equally. Um, and I mean that respectfully, not in a channel-changing way that some characters have. I think both of these women have equally dislikable characters. And I shouldn't be saying that about Sasha. I should be saying about that about Carmella, which is a compliment to her. It's a kind of backhanded compliment to Sasha, as in you should be heel if you're going to continue this character the way it is. It's like she turned babyface, again, for all the reasons that don't make sense, and then never bothered to change her character itself. She just, you know, she was just plopped and plucked from heel and then you got thrown into baby face but yet you kept all the same attributes as you did as a heel that that's not how that works that's not how you successfully transition from a heel to a baby face you need to to evolve you need to change your character a bit and i'm not saying a 180 where she needs to be you know kissing up and pandering i hate that crap too but my god i mean i don't know she on camera right now is anybody else feeling this is anybody else feeling this with sasha banks I don't know. Um, I could absolutely see her dropping the belt at TLC. And uh, honestly, I wouldn't care if she did because I don't like her in this role. I think she's a great wrestler. I think she's she's good on the mic. I just don't think the current version of her belongs as a baby face. She should be a heel. I'm not saying she's channel changing at all. That's not my. That's not what I'm saying. But certainly there needs to be an adjustment in her character. The way it's presented is extremely unlikable. But we got this match, though, between... Sasha Banks and, uh, and and Carmella. And why, again? <laughs> Is it because baby faces are just supposed to be these just foolish champions that will face anyone anytime, put the belt up, just because it's more important to show you're a fighting champion than use common sense? I guess that's what Vince thinks, because we get yet another championship match on SmackDown, which makes championship matches feel very unimportant, because we get them all the time. I've been going on a rant about this forever, too. How many times do we need to see championship matches on free TV? Introducing Elevated Recovery at ElevatedRecovery.org. Would you like to regain control of your life from compulsive sexual behaviors such as sex and porn addiction, which is disrupting your happiness, career, and other relationships? Does your professional position or prominence in your community make traditional recovery impossible for you? Elevated Recovery is an online addiction recovery service for busy professionals. They have successfully guided hundreds of high-achieving men and their partners through uncontrollable sexual behaviors. Behaviors such as serial affairs, porn addiction, habits of patronizing prostitutes, and other situations that have left well-meaning, good men open to the risks of divorce, job loss, sexual harassment litigation, and severe underachievement in their own lives. At Elevated Recovery, their clients include top-performing sales professionals, business owners, physicians, celebrity broadcast personalities, professional athletes, lawyers, engineers, and politicians from over 20 countries. 
Elevated Recovery is endorsed by therapists, mental health professionals, marriage counselors, and relationship experts from around the globe. Learn more by visiting the website elevatedrecovery.org. That's elevatedrecovery.org. Go check it out now. You can also connect on Instagram, Elevated Recovery, and connect on Facebook, Porn Reboot, and follow on Twitter at Reboot Porn. Number one, they very rarely, although they do happen, uh, very rarely do they actually result in the championship changing hands. And yes, Drew McIntyre is certainly the biggest and most recent uh, retort to that. And I understand that. But that is way more the exception than the rule. I don't know if they think that it brings in viewers or if it's going to draw in, you know, uh, people that aren't watching wrestling to come back. I don't think it does. You know why? Because it's always happening. It's always happening. And it's to me, when you put championship matches on TV that don't need to be on TV, when you're doing it clearly to just draw more viewers, which I understand, they're a business. You want viewers. You have sponsors, all that. You're on the network. You're supposed to. I get it. But to me, when you do it this much, it is really representative of creative and their inability to create fascinating, deep, engaging storylines and use championship matches as a cover to basically hide the fact that they suck at creating great stories, great characters, all that kind of thing. Like That's exactly what this is. When you have that kind of stuff, just like when you're, people are always concerned about how great the matches are, instead of being worried about the, you know, the actual story going in and why these two people are fighting, what's at stake, what's going to happen to the loser and the winner, you know, to me it's very superficial with the moves and how great the match is. It's a cover for how bad creative is, which is why people have tuned out over the last 10 years is because they have tuned out emotionally from wrestling because the emotion went and you kept with the athleticism, which keeps a lot of fans there. You know, if you have your diehards, you have your new generation of fans and I get that too. But to me, athleticism being having great five-star matches and championship matches all the time, are all superficial covers for the deeper issue that has not been resolved, and that is being able to create great stories, great uh, great characters, and tell the story successfully. That's what it is. I, I mean, I'm calling a spade a spade here. It's exactly what it is, and why we see so many uh, so many damn uh, championship matches on free TV. But uh, okay. Anyway, uh, boy, oh boy, I'm on a I'm on a freaking moon right now but okay let's get to something good let's get to something good and and that is the Seamus and Drew McIntyre dynamic now again I know I did a full Monday Night Raw review that is up and you can you know uh, re- listen to that so honestly I don't really remember what I said almost a, a week ago but uh, when I'm looking back at this now from six days with Drew McIntyre and Seamus and they had their brawl backstage that was kind of like, oh, they're brothers fighting. And they, at the end of the day, they're, you know, they still love each other, but, you know, they fight like brothers. I kind of, you know, I know you're thinking I'm going to make fun of this. I actually like it. Because when's the last time this happened? When's the last time that you saw any program, male, female, SmackDown, Raw, NXT, where you had people so close that you know they they started brawling with one another and you go oh, wow well, that that's over that friendship's over that that relationship's over and it actually made them stronger it actually brought them together at the end of the day rather than actually tearing it apart and you they're actually you know they're going to have a full fledged program together that almost never happens i can't even remember the last time that it did happen this is an interesting interesting story going on with Seamus, who to right now to me is more interesting than he's ever been almost ever Almost ever. Um, I, I did not like his iteration with Jeff Hardy. I thought his constant uh, constant you know, tr- tricks to, to get him to drink were low brow and really were not good timing with COVID and people actually turning to drugs and alcohol. Not a good story to tell at that time. It, it, it was just, it, it, boy, um, not good. But right now, Seamus and Drew, I like the chemistry. Seamus back in the kind of main event scene is strangely refreshing. I'm willing to go with an eventual Sheamus championship run eventual, whenever that may be. I'm not saying he's going to take it off Drew. I'm just saying it definitely could lead to something down the line in 2021. 
maybe he ends up accidentally screwing AJ Styles or screwing uh, Drew McIntyre out of the championship. AJ Styles wins it, and then you have an actual program with Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. I mean, that that's possible. Maybe I'm tipping my hand a bit for my prediction show, but uh, we'll see what happens on Monday Night Raw. Maybe things will change. But to have them put hands on each other, you think, oh, that's it. They're broken up. And actually, it didn't. It, that's it's kind of cool. Because I don't know, again, the last time that's been done, I, tell, somebody tell me. Somebody tell me the last time that's happened. So, uh, and, and you know what, Sheamus in that role? He's a veteran. He is stiff in the ring. He's You can't see through his work. He's a big dude. Uh, you know, he's, he's good uh, as promos go. I just give him like a six out of ten. He's, he's good, six and a half. Uh, he's got all the tools. And he's a good heel when he wants to be. And they could do something here with Sheamus and Drew and actually split them apart. So I think if Sheamus ends up screwing Drew intentionally or unintentionally, that's going to be the true split. They're not going to fight like brothers. They're going to fight like enemies. And that's the true split with these two. So uh, look for that. That's my kind of early thought that could evolve Um, after Monday Night Raw. We'll have to see what happens there. But I like it. I really do. And AJ Styles and Drew McIntyre. I think number one, as we're all thinking, although I hate saying it because I just went on a 20 or not 20 minute, but um, it was a 10 minute rant about people concerned about match quality rather than this deeper story. I do think that this could be a really good match. They haven't really, or no, I don't believe they've ever had a match together. So I'm not worried though, because they're two veterans. They're two guys that have traveled the roads. Uh, AJ can work with anybody. Drew McIntyre is stupid athletic. I have no worries about the quality of the match. None. Zero. Uh, I also am interested in uh, AJ Styles' associate in this match because there will be some kind of standoff between AJ Styles' associate. Uh, I can't forgive me. I can't remember his name. And Drew McIntyre at TLC. There will be some kind of cool moment there. And uh, that that's going to be, I think, very visually pleasing to the eye. So, all right. Well, uh, moving on here. The Fiend and uh, Randy Orton. Fiend finally attacks, leaves Orton laying. And that to me is fine. I, I had a feeling that was coming. I don't know where this leads. And, and more importantly, where does this leave Randy Orton? How does he change? He's already heel. So what does this do for Orton? Does he does he get darker, deeper? I mean, I, I don't think so. So this may be the first time, and I wouldn't be surprised, if this is where the fiend stops changing people and they stop t- speaking about that narrative, because I don't know where you go with Orton. He's already a great heel. He, I mean, I don't know what more you can do to make him even darker, deeper and badder. You know, maybe I'm missing something, but he's already gone to that place. He's already been that guy. So I, I like to me, I like this matchup again. We all love new, and this is certainly a new match, at least in 2020. And, I just don't know what the end game is. That's kind of what I'm like thinking about. I'm like, what, you know, how does this end? Right. So, uh, I've already talked about Goldberg coming back. I've already, I went on the, uh, pretty good rant about that as well, uh, with Goldberg coming back and potentially facing Roman Reigns, which I think could happen at the rumble and or WrestleMania. So, uh, go back to my, oh gosh, what was it? My wrestling nostalgia, I think show that I opened with talking about that. All right, so now I want to talk about Big E. I don't kind of jump it all over the place, but uh, that's how my mind works. Big E on SmackDown. They've changed his music. Good. Big E coming out with the you know, the talcum powder, like as, as a weightlifter or a strongman. Okay, okay. I, I don't. I feel neutral about that. I'm just kind of like, okay, that's a little different. He's still got the colors of the New Day. He may not say New Day on it, or or does it? I can't remember. I remember looking at specifically his attire and going, that's, that's like basically New Day attire. And he still talks like he's in the New Day. He still does the clap like he's in the New Day. He still does the gyrations like he's in the New Day. It's, again, uh, I need a bit of an evolution from him. If he's going to be taken seriously, he needs to get a little more serious. And I'm sure this is a tired response to Drew or to Drew to uh, Big E right now. Corey Graves has said it on air, which means he's, I think, speaking 
as the voice of the fans acknowledging, hey, I hear you. We hear you. We're going to do this. And it's just a matter of time. And I hope they do. But right now, I do not like what they've done with Big E's transition to singles right now. It's it's very ho-hum. It's just kind of he's the he's just New Day's leftovers. And while he's still really good in the ring and he's just very flamboyant and bombastic and cartoonish on the mic – he needs to do something different, for God's sakes. I don't need to see this man do his hip swivels and his just, you know, New Day rocks thing. Like, stop. Please. Please. You know, like, I, I just, it's it's just uh, just tired for me. But uh, Sami Zayn this week, I mean, Sami Zayn's always just damn brilliant, isn't he? Sami Zayn is a true entertainer in every sense of the word. He makes you hate him. But like, kind of love him, but you still want to see someone kick his ass type of heel. It's not a I would cheer for him. He still knows how to turn it on, and he's I think one of the unsung heroes of SmackDown. And him and Big E working this past week in a match was good, and it left you wanting more. As Sami Zayn always finds a way to win a match via countout or disqualification. It's just great storytelling by Sami Zayn, and. I expect that this leads to an intercontinental championship match for Big E, and I'm all for that. You know why? Because this is what I think they've learned from Rowan Reigns as to, hey, don't skip the titles in between and go straight to the top. I, <laughs> this should be a pretty darn red flag if they decided to put him in a championship opportunity right now, and I think they're playing it smart. And I know there's a lot of fans out there who are saying, but Big E, he should be in the championship picture. What are they doing? I don't think he should be yet. Do I want him there? Yes, I do want Big E in a championship, big championship, universal championship level picture. But what are they going to do right now? Number one, Big E's character has not evolved. Until I see Big E's character evolve, I do not want him anywhere near the championship. I, it would be an absolute nightmare if he was champion as basically the, the, the uh, spinoff of the New Day in his current iteration. Imagine that. Imagine, I would go, I mean, it would be an explosion on this show. Like, it, they, they can't do that. And also, you have Roman Reigns, who is probably the best thing in WWE right now, rolling like nobody's rolling. And to have Big E come in and challenge Roman, you, you, you can't have Big E win. you got to have Roman go over because he's doing so damn well. So that would essentially squash the, the run for Big E right up front. There's just, it's not good timing. The timing's not good for Big E to challenge for that championship yet. Could he have a big showing in the Royal Rumble? Yes, absolutely he could. Maybe come down to the final two. Certainly. Maybe it's Drew and Big E. I mean, early call on that. We'll see how that stands the test of time. But right now, it's just not good timing. There's a lot of back end work, foundational work to do on Big E with character. Maybe tweak his music a little more promos for god's sakes stop with all of the nonsense of the new day just it, it, we need to move on but um, speaking of nonsense street profits my god uh, first of all let me say and i will continue to say this damn montez ford is good in the ring isn't he he is just he's so good um just so good and easily easily the star of that team and angelo dawkins knows it uh, and everyone knows it. He is the star of the team, and whenever these two break up, he will continue his ascent into stardom. So that is certainly what I'm looking forward to with uh, with Montez Ford. But as they currently stand, okay, I, and I know I have, and I even a like, caller last week, or you know, they love the the whole Street Profits the you know stuff. To me, it's childish. Like it's childish. Uh, just entertainment. There, there's no adult substance to it. I don't know how, as a as a grown man, I'm supposed to enter, be entertained by this. I don't. I don't understand the New Day's personality. Again, I want people to di- differentiate in ring. They're really good. Montez Ford is just. I mean, look out. This guy's got you know future champion written all over him. It's the personality behind the scenes when they're you know always standing side by side, standing at the camera, talking about smoke. And like again, I know what smoke means. Okay, I understand that they're just obnoxious. They're not funny. I don't find anything they say funny. 
they're always commenting on everyone else's stories in like kind of gibberish slang, uh, you know, normal words. <laughs> I mean, like I'd say 60% of what they say I can understand. And the other 40% I'm like, you know what, even though I could understand it, I don't want to. Like, it's just, it's the antithesis of somebody I would ever hang out with ever. And maybe that's what it is. Like if somebody I knew in real life was like this, I would stay so far away from them. I wouldn't want to be in the same room, in the same house, in the same building. In this, I would just like it, it, it. That is maybe what it is. It's on a personal level that I cannot stand how they act. It is obnoxious. It's immature. It it's not funny. There's no other than just being flamboyant and and just speaking in kind of half rhyme, half slang. I don't understand the entertainment value in these guys. I just don't. Um, I, I know that they're successful and props to them and they're certain they got a bright future. Absolutely. They're great. But personality wise, they're just booked wrong. If you want to keep their same personalities, turn them heel because they're basically our heel to me. So, uh, okay. I could, I could have rant about their, their nonsense forever, but you know, Drew McIntyre or Drew McIntyre, Dolph Ziggler and, um, Robert Roode come out and you know what? Like, are they much better? <laughs> It's Drew McIntyre or Drew McIntyre. Jeez. Dolph Ziggler that much better. Dolph Ziggler with his self-deprecating humor about calling himself a poor man's HBK. And then, I don't know. He, he was talking about some people. I don't even know who the hell they are. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. We all know how good Ziggler is in the ring. But does anyone actually have any belief in his character? I, I don't. Corey Graves actually said something during the match uh, that was really funny. I, I don't know if it was meant to be so, but he talked about Dolph Ziggler when he faced Montez Ford and how, you know, if, oh, if there's, you know, with the tenure of uh, Dolph Ziggler, or how long he's been here, he knows one thing and that's how to win. It was something along those lines. It was pretty close to that. And I'm thinking to myself, if there's anything, Dolph Ziggler is the one guy that doesn't know how to win. Dolph Ziggler, he, he was a world champion, but out of a fluke on the Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania, like six years ago. Like Dolph Ziggler has no idea how to win. If you look at Dolph Ziggler's career, my God, that's the one thing that he's been consistent about is being inconsistent. So I I mean, that's actually what Dolph Ziggler is known for and why his character just people don't believe in because they've been educated for eight years to just go, well, WWE is not going to do anything with him. So, you know, he's has great matches and he has good promos but it's a joke. I mean, does, does Corey Graves understand the irony of what he said? I, it, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. Uh, so anyway, you know, it's also interesting too with Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. To me, they are a team that's a wrestling, a wrestler's wrestler, if that makes sense. Or as we have Cesaro talking about, he's the wrestling purist. And I agree with that. Like they aren't, like wrestling at its core. They're, they're so good, especially Cesaro. And they got put in a match with, uh, who, oh, Otis and, uh, Chad Gable, who got his first name back. And they're doing this whole alpha thing They're you know, he's in alpha training, all this kind of thing. Fine. You know, it's to me, this is the most relevant thing that Chad Gable's ever done. And it's the lowest point of what Otis has ever done. So imagine that where we actually have Chad Gable at the height of his career and we have we have uh, Otis at the low point of his career. And you could argue Chad Gable and King Corbin in the finals of the King Ring of the Ring tournament, but you know, he went on to lose to King Corbin many many times. So, you know, when when you also dissect the whole Otis character, my god, what a fall from grace. I mean, you look at this guy who is Vince McMahon's comedy man or was and where he came from, where, you know, what they had planned for him to do. And God knows what that plan was with the money, in the bank briefcase before he lost it to the Miz. I don't know what that plan was. I'm assuming cashing in successfully. Imagine him doing that on Roman. I think people would boo the hell out of that. But to me, this is the lowest point Otis has ever been because he was on top with the money in the bank briefcase. He got the girl at WrestleMania. They finally kissed. Oh my God, they're together. Mandy Rose gets traded to Raw because apparently the Miz made it happen. 
Otis loses the Money in the Bank briefcase. And then he gets beat down by Roman Reigns last week, although we're all supposed to forget that. Remember that? Yeah, he's just fine this week. I mean, so yeah, there's that. Uh, he got betrayed by Tucker, who's been MIA. <laughs> uh, and now he's with Chad Gable doing these uh, alpha trainings and being played for a fool of just being uh, used by Chad Gable to win matches. I mean, does it get any lower for Otis right now? But I'm fine with that. Because I think Otis has value. I think Otis could be a big-time player in time. And if the rumors are true of him going back to the Performance Center, i.e. the Capital Wrestling Center, for improvement in the ring, then that's fine. Look. It's fine. Just because you're on the main roster doesn't mean sometimes you don't need a quick tune-up. I mean, that's what the pit stop's for on the runway in NASCAR. I mean, sometimes you need the pit stop. You're running. You, you kind of need to sharpen things up. Fine. That doesn't mean I, I want him sent back or gone. I think he's got value. I just despise the way Vince McMahon has used him over the last several months of being this just kind of gargantuan, you know, big heap of a man who loves his roly-poly belly and is obsessed with food and stops in the middle of a money in the bank match to, uh, you know, stop at the cafeteria, all that nonsensical stuff that just eats at my soul. I mean, literally eats at my soul when I see that stuff, because I don't, I just want to like, I just want to shake Vince McMahon and shake Kevin Dunn and be like, what do you think? Why do you think Otis is in the position he's in? You know, take a little responsibility. Maybe it's the way you presented him. Ay. But right now, Otis is in rebuilding, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding stage, and that is fine. That's cool. Sometimes that happens, and I'm totally okay with where Otis is positioned. I'm way more comfortable with the way he's positioned with Chad Gable than I was with him carrying that briefcase, dreading the moment he cashes in. So there is that. Okay, uh, moving on here to. Uh, the Riot Squad, who I don't really talk about much on this show because they're hardly ever relevant, but they got a, a victory, and that's a, a, a positive. They defeated Natalia and Billy Kay as Billy Kay continues to do her headshot thing and her resume, and uh, it's mildly entertaining. You know who's not entertaining though? Natalia. Okay, N- Natalia. She's not the boat. I understand she thinks that's clever, calling instead of the goat the boat. I mean, LOL, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, I, Natalia is so boring to me as a character. Just, just She's just like, she's like the wallpaper. She's just there. Right? She's just always there. She's never going to be the focus of, of attention or the topic of conversation, but she's just there. She is literally wallpaper. And um, like I, I think that Liv Morgan and uh, uh, Ruby Riot really have something potentially more serious going on here in in a good way because they could eventually challenge for the women's tag team championships just because we have Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler on Raw doesn't mean that you can't have these two challenge because that's a it's a um, a dual brand championship Uh, I think a lot of them a lot of championships would probably be dual brand but that's another story so Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan here got a victory and does this mean anything is this a launching point I don't know I thought with Natalia beating Bailey last week clean that that was going to be a launching point for Natalia and look where she is this week on the losing end of a tag team match that almost meant nothing. So they're, you know, they they can't even build things from week to week. I mean, having Natalia beat Bailey last week was a big deal considering how much they built Bailey over the summer. Clean. And what did they do with her? The answer is nothing. They had Natalia on the losing end of a, a a match that again meant nothing. But this is Really building to hopefully a championship match for Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. I think that'd be a great way to uh, continue their progression, and I think it's, it's a much different Riot Squad than the first version. So uh, yeah, we don't have Sarah Logan there. I guess she's having a baby or something um, with uh, Eric of the uh, Viking Raiders. So yeah, but you didn't know that. But hey, we also have the EST of SmackDown. And Bailey on a collision course. So there's something new, right? We we do have that. We have something new for Bailey, and I, I'm fine with it. You know, Ding Dong and her whole thing. Like, I love Bailey's character. She really found herself as a heel. So I, I'm looking for uh, you know big things from her. And really, 
Also from Bianca Belair, who to me is probably WWE's focus over the next six months in the women's division, particularly if she beats Bailey clean. So look for that too. I think that she could be that next, that next one up to be a big, big player in the women's division. Um, I'll end by talking about the raw women's division, which is just a total mess uh, because we have Oscar as champion. That's right. Yeah, she still is. I know we all forgot about the raw women's championship, but that's because Oscar has no one to defend it against. That's scary. Scary. And we have Asuka messing around with Lana, who's messing around with the uh, the Women's Tag Team Championships of N- uh, Champions of Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. And yes, we got Lana versus Nia Jax this week, of which I fully expect Lana to win. But Nia, uh, we have Asuka again. She's basically irrelevant right now. And that she's been irrelevant for quite some time. This isn't just a week or two weeks. This has been like a couple of months. You know, I, I, I don't... I don't know. It's... It's scary. It's scary for the women's championship on Raw. But I've said it before. I'll say it again. I really believe this is because they are just having Asuka tread water until Charlotte returns. Or they call someone up from NXT. So we will have to see. So, all right, guys. That does it for me for this week in WWE. I'm sure I have a lot of feedback on this show as I just tore down a lot of teams and things going on. But I also had a lot of good things to say, which I really do try to do. Because you can get on negative rants for so long. And there's so many podcasts out there that do that. And I don't want to be one of them that cusses and all that kind of thing. I don't think that's... I think that's more of just clickbait and trying to get attention. Where instead of just authentic reactions and how I actually feel unapologetically... That's what, to me, this is, sets it apart, and I have the, a passion for this. I want to see it change. I want to see it improve. I don't just want to just rant to rant because it gets me clicks. I don't care about that. Uh, that's, that's not why we're here. We're here to talk wrestling authentically, and that's what we do. I really think that. I really do. Every, every host we have is a very passionate wrestling fan and uh, appreciative, of all, appreciative of all of the uh, team members we have. So, all right. Well, guys, again, rest of the week is jam-packed. We have Tuesday night which is going to be Raw Review. Wednesday night is Nostalgia, and then Thursday is the Mailbag. If we get enough uh, if we get enough voicemails, I'm not going to do a whole show if we just have one or two, but uh, Mailbag is coming also that very same day. Friday's Rivalries. Saturday is Michael Ritter's SmackDown Review. Very uh, good co-host as well. Check him out. And then Saturday night will be your week, or no, your TLC preview and prediction show Sunday night will be the botch guy and myself reviewing the TLC pay-per-view. Uh, so a jam packed week coming. It's a pay-per-view week, which means a lot more wrestling audio coming your way, including of course, don't want to forget to mention our NXT review uh, show on Wednesdays with Zach Smith. So tons of stuff coming guys. Thank you so much. If you love us, head on over to Apple and give us a five-star rating and review there. It does help us out really, really big time. Please give us a five-star rating and review there if you like us. If you want to get in contact with us, Podcast at gmail.com. All right. Well, that's it for me, guys. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon.